When wrestling fans think of pole matches, they instantly think of Vince Russo. Russo seemed to have a thing for wrestlers trying to retrieve items that have been set up high above the turnbuckles, and it kinda became a meme. Russo books a show, expect a pole match. Of course, Vince wouldn't book a pole match on every single show he overseen, but he did book quite a few of them over the years. So what we're gonna do in today's video is take a look at every on a pole match that took place while Vince Russo was involved in creative. Now, just to be clear, it's possible that other people were involved in these match bookings too. For example, Vince McMahon would still have to give a thumbs up to whatever creative Russo brought to him, so keep that in mind. Russo gets quite defensive in regards to pole matches and fans constantly calling him out for booking them so often, but to be fair, his tweet may be factually incorrect here, but he does have a point. He did more than just book pole matches, for better or for worse. Even though Russo did more than just book pole matches, the match type did become synonymous with Vince as a rider, and that's something he can't escape. Retrieving items that have been set up on a pole wasn't a Russo creation, but he sure did become known for booking a lot of these matches. There's two main variations of pole matches. In one variation, you retrieve an item that hangs or sits on a pole and you win the match. In another, whoever grabs the item first can use the item legally inside the ring to help pick up a victory. Long before the match type got absolutely meme to death, there were some matches that involved items on a pole. The coal miners glove matches that date all the way back to the early 70s were initially known for their brutality, giving us a contrast when comparing the violence of a coal miners glove to a pinata on a pole bout. Maybe the most well-known coal miners glove match happened at Halloween Havoc 1992, Sting vs Jake Roberts. The AWA got ridiculous with pole matches long before Russo did also. They had an infamous turkey on a pole match during the final days of the company as part of their team challenge series. Colonel De Beers, representing Sergeant Slaughter's team, took on Jake the Milkman Milliman, representing Team Larry Zabisco. And it's just what it sounds like, two guys fighting over a turkey. A nightstick on a pole match also took place at Survivor Series 1992, The Big Boss Man vs Nails. The match didn't end when one man grabbed the nightstick, but instead the weapon could be used inside the ring once retrieved, the boss man won the match. There are other examples too, but I'm just showing a few pole matches that took place before Russo came along. But let's move on to the matches that were booked while Vince Russo was in creative within some capacity, and we'll take a look at the stuff that made it to TV during and after the Monday Night Wars. I think the first match that fits into our time frame would be the flag match held on the 21st of July 1997. Bret Hart, Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith versus Dude Love, Steve Austin and The Undertaker. This match happened on WWF Raw Is War. Held in Halifax, Nova Scotia, the Hart Foundation had to grab the maple leaf while the babyfaces tried to grab the stars and stripes. Of course, being in Canada, it was actually the Hart Foundation who got the big babyface reaction, and the crowd popped huge when Bret Hart retrieved the Canadian flag to win the match. This flag match absolutely worked though in the context of the Hearts vs America storyline, and it also worked because it was held in Canada, it was actually a fantastic idea at the time. So good was the first flag match that the World Wrestling Federation done it again on pay per view. Bad Blood took place just two months later, Bret Hart and Davey Boy Smith took on The Patriot and Vader in another flag match, and once again the Hart Foundation came out on top. This one was different though, pinfalls and submissions could also end the match, and the match ended with Bret pinning The Patriot. The Hart Foundation wouldn't last much longer within the World Wrestling Federation, but it would have been good if the flag matches became the team's speciality. There was nothing goofy or silly about these match types in 1997, and again, they really suited the Hart Foundation in terms of character and storyline. On the 14th of December 1998, Jeff Jarrett defeated Steve Blackman in a guitar on a pole match, which is a little more silly than a flag match. This is where your spidey senses start going off. Jarrett retrieved the guitar but it wasn't used in the match, Owen Hart ran down with another guitar and Blackman got clocked, allowing Double J to score a pinfall win. Two and a half minutes of in ring action here and I know I said it was a bit silly but it still worked for the whole Jeff Jarrett character. If we say October 1999 is the cutoff date for Russo's time in the WWF, then we have two more WWF pole matches to look at. The Test vs Bossman Nightstick on a Pole match from the May 10th 1999 episode of Raw, 
and the infinitely more Russo-esque Pepper on a Pole match from the 16th of September 99 edition of Smackdown. The Raw match was pretty straightforward, Tess grabbed the nightstick but Bossman had a telescopic nightstick hidden away, this allowed Bossman to take the weapon away from Tess and the Bossman scored the win. The Pepper on a Pole match though, oh boy. It again featured the big boss man, only this time he was taking on Al Snow. Pepper was Al Snow's little dog who boss man took away. Al begged for the return of his little friend and he became increasingly distraught about losing his pet. Boss man invited Snow to his hotel room to get Pepper back but first of all, boss man wanted to make amends by giving Al something to eat. Al tucked in and boss man revealed that Snow was eating Pepper. <laughs> On Smackdown the following week, all that remained of Pepper were put in a doggy bag. If Al Snow wanted what was left of his little dog, all he had to do was climb up a pole and retrieve the bag in a special Pepper on a pole match. It's absolutely nuts condensing all this down and saying it out loud. Bossman was about to win the match but a few dog handlers and a few rottweilers made their way down to the ring. The dog kennel of hell match was announced before this pole match took place by the way and Bossman decides to throw away the bag in order to escape the doggos. So even though Bossman technically won, Al Snow still got the bag. Davy Boy Smith was there to help Al Snow because he's called the British Bulldog I guess, I don't know, fantastic. Alright, if the pepper on a pole match was indeed a Vince Russo idea then he sure went out with a bang. When Vince arrived in WCW it didn't take long for pole matches to begin taking place but to be fair also, WCW had recently dabbled in pole matches as recently as 1998. Hollywood Hogan and Kevin Nash took on Roddy Piper and the Giant in a baseball bat on a pole match at Spring Stampede 1998. Russo was definitely in the head rider position though by the time November 99 came around and on the first Nitro of the month, we had a key on a pole match between Eddie Guerrero and Perry Saturn. The key would open up a cage, inside that cage was Tori Wilson and are you noticing yet that these pole matches are becoming progressively more ridiculous? Anyway, Wilson was kidnapped by the revolution and her freedom was put up for grabs. If the filthy animals Eddie Guerrero could climb up and grab the key before Perry Saturn, then Tori would be free. Now, this match actually isn't all that bad when you look at the action going on inside the ring, so you can't really rip this one apart. It isn't a must see classic, but it's passable. Yes, Tori's cage getting brought out by Saturn in a forklift is maybe a bit over the top and the stipulation too is quite out there but the match itself is absolutely fine. Eddie had some trouble grabbing the key, he couldn't reach it and he had difficulties climbing the pole. It took a leap of faith to win the match and this one could have fell right into Botchamania territory if Guerrero missed that key. Tori Wilson returns to the filthy animals, all's right with the world. This one wasn't too bad but the next one would become legendary when we talk about Vince Russo and pole matches. A mere two weeks after the key on a pole match, Russo booked a five way match, El Dandy, Psychosis, Juventud Guerrera, Silver King and Viano 5. Five lucha stars and five guys who would take part in the infamous pinata on a pole match. Russo in storyline said there would be a check inside the pinata for 10 grand. The competitors would be given sticks, they could beat each other up or they could try to beat up the pinata to grab the check. Yeah, even worse was the fact that Ed Ferrara made fun of Jim Ross at the commentary table while a returning Dr. Death Steve Williams stood there watching the match. The pinata also fell off the pole quite early on and no one tried to break it open, so what we end up getting is truly one of the most questionable and stupid matches in the history of WCW Nitro and trust me here, I've watched every episode. Hoovy lifts up the pinata and he tries to put it back on the pole realizing he isn't 10 feet tall in the process and he's left standing there looking like an idiot. Viano 5 also tries to put it back up but he's attacked while doing so. Nobody has a clue what to do. Eventually Hoovy grabs the pinata, he climbs up the turnbuckles and he just starts shaking it until the check falls out but then Steve Williams jumps in the ring taking everyone out and putting the cash in his pocket. A fine display of why having Vince Russo on your team doesn't equal success, it can potentially and more than likely will have the reverse effect. 
Take away the piñata and the god-awful mockery of Jim Ross on commentary, and it's still a pretty bad match. Russo would say quite a lot that he wanted to give everyone something to do on the card, not just the main eventers, and that's very noble. But that also means that nonsense like this takes place. I think I'd rather just watch the main eventers. Another pole match took place the next week, that's three in the month of November, plus there was one more in December, making it feel like Russo really had a thing for pole matches. Dean Malenko vs Chris Benoit was a flag match, so at least it was a little more sensible. Benoit was once a member of the Revolution, but he left along with Malenko. Malenko had tricked Benoit though, and the Iceman was still part of the group. The flag match they had here was in the same vein as the WWF matches, America vs Canada. But the problem here was the fact that Malenko was the heel and Benoit was the babyface. Nitro was held in Michigan, so the crowd chanted USA. The object was to grab your own country's flag, but Dean wanted to burn the maple leaf. Dean gets hold of the Canadian flag, and the referee still calls for the bell, awarding Dean the match even though the match rule stated that he had to capture the American flag. What an absolute mess. The Revolution tries to burn both flags, but Bret Hart runs down for the save. It all ended with Bret waving the American flag while Benoit waves the Canadian flag. There's a reason why no one remembers this absolute travesty. Three weeks later at Starcade 99, Diamond Dallas Page and David Flair had a 4 minute crowbar on a pole match. So Flair had been going off the deep end and he tried to attack both DDP and Kimberly with a crowbar, his new weapon of choice. A match was booked for Starcade where a crowbar would hang from a pole and whoever got it first could use it as a weapon. Only problem here is David Flair bringing his own golden crowbar to the match and using it on Page right before the opening bell. Only in WCW guys, <laughs> only in WCW. The attack led to the referee almost throwing the match out but Page got back in the ring. Flair retrieved the proper crowbar but Page hits a diamond cutter to end the match. So Dallas didn't even need to use the gimmick in order to win. Dallas hits Flair with another diamond cutter and just as he was about to attack David with the crowbar, out comes a female fan to protect Flair. This of course would be Daphne. An extremely poor Starcade match here that had a real questionable layout. Three weeks later we have another pole match. This time it's Champagne on a pole. Yeah, Champagne. Nothing was off limits when it came to Vince Russo and pole matches. This one took place on Thunder, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's been completely erased from your memory, but we have Bam Bam Bigelow taking on Chris Canyon on the 12th of January 2000. Champagne Canyon broke a bottle of champagne over his former Jersey Triad teammate a few weeks prior on Nitro. The two then had a bit of a back and forth that involved champagne bottles. And well, there's only one way to settle this. Get a little bit of the bubbly and put it in a nice bucket, hang the bucket off a pole, and see who can use it first as a weapon. Kenyon got the bottle but he doesn't get a chance to use it, Bam Bam takes it away and he decides he isn't going to use it either. Bam Bam gets the win and the item both men were trying to retrieve doesn't even come into play at all. Why would you- what's the- uh, never mind. Lex Luger comes down afterwards wearing Sting face paint and he attacks Bigelow. Just look at Lex. The match wrapped up with another run in, this time it was a crow and Lex Luger backed off from our feathered friend as fans began slowly reaching for their remote controls. The next match took place when Russo wasn't even working for the company. He was sent home briefly, so we can't be too harsh here. A leather jacket on a pole match between Tank Abbott and Big Al. Who's Big Al? I don't know, but this one took place at Super Brawl 10. This was billed as a skins match, the leather jacket being the skin. Tank Abbott's UFC jacket was placed on a pole, and Tony Schiavone says no one knows what will happen here when Tank Abbott faces his former bodyguard. Honestly, nobody could have predicted what was going to happen here, Tony was absolutely right. It starts off with both guys strapping their hands together with a leather belt, they then proceed to swear at each other quite loudly and then they lay in the right hands. Abbott gets knocked out with a forearm and the belt breaks. Abbott is out cold as Big Al, who is this guy anyway? But Big Al tries the old crotch at the ring post spot but Abbott is unresponsive here. What finally does wake Abbott up is Big Al standing on his face, not even joking. 
Abbott comes back and he goes to retrieve the jacket while holding Al on his shoulders, but that clearly doesn't work. Well, Abbott ends up grabbing the jacket and winning the match, and then the cameras have to cut very quickly when Tank makes a startling thread on live pay-per-view while holding a knife. Absolutely insane, but as mentioned, it looks like Russo's hands were clean of this one. WCW Saturday Night on the 1st of April 2000 had a hardcore title on a pole match, so it kinda feels like a poor man's ladder match. Better yet, hardcore champion Brian Nobbs brought out a ladder for the match, so I don't know, it feels like WCW were memeing themselves at this point, but don't worry, it gets worse. Nobbs successfully retained the title here, it was a six man match that also featured Norman Smiley, Rick Fuller, the dog Al Green, Adrian Bird and Dave Burkhead. A main event lineup if there ever was one. An absolute cluster of a match, Nobbs used the ladder to retrieve the belt and nothing more to say. Russo was still gone while this one took place but when he came back, boy did he come back with a bang. Viagra on a pole ladies and gentlemen, the franchise Shane Douglas vs Billy Kidman. WCW Nitro 31st of July 2000. Tori Wilson left Billy Kidman, she started hanging around Shane Douglas, and Tori told Shane and everyone else that poor little Billy had some problems downstairs. He had a floppy jalopy. To prove her wrong, Billy showed a tape to everyone who was watching Nitro, a home video he and Tori made where there seemed to be no issues with Kidman's performance in the bedroom. On Thunder, Kidman showed a tape where Shane Douglas ended up with a little shy sausage because because he was so distraught about seeing Tori in bed with Billy. And so, the next week, Ernest Miller announced that there would be some dick roids up for grabs in a special pole match. Whoever grabbed the bottle of blue bombers would not only win the match, but they'd be sure to have a bionic rod at the end of the night. It's crazy to think that this happened, but it did. You won the match after claiming the bottle. So no, you couldn't just pop a handful of those bad boys and make your opponent tap out. Unfortunately, they screwed up the ending, excuse the pun. The bottle broke prematurely after Kidman grabbed it, it actually gave Shane a bad cut on the back too. The referee was distracted and when he turned around, Kidman was laid out and Shane had a piece of the bottle, meaning Shane won the contest. It's great to joke about today, but back then, old school WCW fans were up in arms. The following week we had more pole action, but to be fair, we went back to basics. A pipe on a pole match between Big Papa Pump Scotty Steiner and the icon Sting. Strangely, you win this match by just grabbing the pipe, you don't need to use it to beat up your opponent for a pinfall afterwards. I'm also convinced that the pipe fell off the pole too, but we don't see it on TV. The fans are laughing and pointing at the corner of the ring, and we never see the pipe suspended above the turnbuckles afterwards. Rick Steiner magically has it in his hands a few minutes later. Scott wins thanks to his brother. Sting finds himself in the Steiner recliner, but Kevin Nash runs out for the save. A fight breaks out, security rushes down, and that's pretty much it. Next though we have the one you've all been probably waiting for, Judy Bagwell on a pole at WCW New Blood Rising. Judy Bagwell on a pole, or Judy Bagwell on a forklift, what the f- If Positively Canyon can beat Buff Bagwell, then Mama Bagwell becomes Canyon's valet, or Canyon's Kimberly, as it were. Now, this is grade A wrestle crap right here, no two ways about it, but it's actually not a pole match or even a special stipulation match, and this is what people get wrong about this all the time. It's a plain and simple no DQ match, the only way you can win is via pinfall or submission. Judy Bagwell was just there for eye candy I guess. It's not a match about retrieval or anything like that, it's only called Judy Bagwell on a pole or Judy Bagwell on a forklift because, well, there she is on a forklift. David Arquette also got involved and he tried to help Kenyon, adding to the match's shit factor tenfold, but Buff wins with a double blockbuster. 7 minutes of in-ring action here, and a lifetime of ridicule for Vince Russo. Kenyon ends up hitting Arquette with a Kenyon cutter after the bout. A stickball on a pole match took place on the September 11th episode of Monday Nitro between Reno and Big Vito, and check out those empty seats. Reno won the match, it wasn't good, I've nothing to say about this one. The next one though was Russo's final pole match of WCW and he definitely went out in style. 
a San Francisco's 49ers match or a box on a pole match. You've got four boxes suspended above the turnbuckles. Inside one of those boxes is the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Inside the other boxes, well, they said on commentary they would include weapons of some sort. Booker T vs Jeff Jarrett, 2nd of October 2000. Box number one? Tony Schiavone says that's not a weapon and I think he's right. It's a Vince Russo attempt at humour. The second box, a picture of Scott Hall. A framed picture of Scott Hall, which to be fair was still used as a weapon. Inside box number three, we come full circle as Booker T finds a cold miner's glove. And box number four of course had the WCW championship but it fell out of the box when Booker tried to retrieve it. Booker T wins and this was the last pole match that Vince Russo booked in WCW. The last pole match that took place on WCW television was a chair on a pole match featuring Ming and Crowbar. It happened on the 3rd of January 2001 episode of Thunder. Crowbar got the chair but he didn't use it effectively at all. Another chair was used on the outside too, making the chair suspended above the ring completely pointless. It ended with Crowbar taking this bump right here and then Ming locked in the Tongan death grip. And that's it, I've had enough. Russo would come and go over at TNA and he booked more pole matches while he was there, including an axe handle on a pole match, baseball bat and guitar on poles, chair on a pole, first blood match, Singapore cane on a pole, headdress on a pole, another keys on a pole match, a rat on a pole, yes, a fucking rat on a pole. But I'm not going to talk about all that TNA nonsense, this has gone on too long already. The WWE also continued to book pole matches even when Russo had moved on, so it's not like it was only Vince Russo who was booking these type of gimmick matches. But as stated at the top of this video, Russo's name and pole matches just seemed to go hand in hand. Progressively though, these matches just got worse. And by the time WCW tried to put on a somewhat serious pole match, like Steiner vs Sting, absolutely no one cared. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and hopefully you didn't pull your eyeballs out. Thanks for watching guys and take care.